uh, rather than me introducing you guys, why don't you just go down the list and uh, what's your name and what do you do? Hi, I'm Dave Madden. I work for Electronic Arts. I need a little more than that. Oh, sorry. It's a big company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm in the game. Uh, I head up a group at Electronic Arts that works with brands to activate with us against our gamers in and around our games, cross promotions, and anything to do with ad tech uh, across console, mobile, PC. So basically helping brands uh, build relationships with our consumers in a way that's great for the gamers, most importantly. Thank you, that was quite thorough. Volkan. Hey guys, I'm Volkan uh, from GRI. Um, and I know, that, you know, Damon is gonna ask what I do. Um, so I'm heading the business intelligence team at GRI. Uh, so we wanna make sure we kind of like maximize the LTV for all, all of our players. Uh, on top of that, um, something that I started as a sidekick, I'm also leading all the indirect uh, monetization efforts at GRI, whether it's video ads, offer roles, it, all of them basically go through me. And the final functionality is I do run crazy experiments on our sound setting titles. Uh, so, you know, if you have time, I can talk about that a little bit more as well. We'll ask about that later. All right. Oh, you're right. Baudon. So I'm Baudon. I'm from Gameloft. Um, so I'm heading our um, publishing activities in North America. So sales and marketing for Gameloft. All right, cool. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, so, so I want to get right into strategy. Uh, there's the age-old debate of, you know, all the studios, and I'm sure, Dave, you, you experience this. I know you do, that the studios are a little bit reluctant to integrate ad technology or ads in their games, but the business guys are always trying to push it from a revenue standpoint. So I'd love each of you to just give a high-level overview of how your company defines their ad monetization strategy. How important is it? You know, you talk about how it compares to other revenue streams, et cetera. How important is ad monetization to your company? Sure, I'd be happy to start. So, so advertising as a term in gaming sometimes can be considered a dirty word to developers. The reality is that brands can play a really impactful role in helping gamers get deeper into gameplay and enjoy their experience. And, and in the console space, as well as the paid console space where someone's spending $65 or $60 to go out and buy a new console game, there's actually an opportunity for brands to interact there. Some of it's very native, very custom, you know, integrating a brand like Gatorade into Madden, where the experience mirrors what you see on TV. But I think for the sake of today's conversation, what we're talking about, native ads, that something that could be scalable for the industry, that gets real lift off, that drives real monetization for developers. And we talk about casual gaming, we're really talking about the freemium business model where less than 5% of your users are really spending money and there's a 95% opportunity to help your consumers, your players get deeper into the content. Forget about making money for a second. If, if your business model is freemium and only 5% of your users are spending money with you, that means 95% of your players are not not necessarily benefiting from all the hard work your developers are doing to make wonderful content. So the opportunity for brands to interlope into the experience is to help consumers really get deeper and further into the content. And when done right, and this is why gaming is such a, a, a wonderful opportunity for advertising. When done right, brands can actually help consumers enjoy the game, get deeper into it, and that sense, the relationship between the player and the advertiser actually is one of consumer consent and control. And when that happens, the results are off, off the charts. So to answer your question, developers are coming around because they know that the minority of their users are spending money and they know there's an opportunity there, but really to make this space lift off for everybody in the room, and for the Procter's and Gambles and McDonald's and Unilevers of the world, it's gotta be great for the consumer. They have to really want to engage with a brand and when they do, those brands get outsized results and that's the kind of stuff that we're starting to see across all game platforms when you let that consumer be in control of their experience. And so from a developer standpoint, I think it's the, the model, because of the growth of freemium, the growth of uh, tablet and smartphone gaming, you're looking at a model that's moving really quickly in combination with the, what we're seeing in the, uh, just out of Madison Avenue where brands are starting to come into mobile, Facebook had a huge 
quarter, last quarter, and just the IAB uh, numbers they've been putting out showing mobile uh, doubling year over year. It's 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 a it's a good time for developers to take uh, take on advertising technology. Cool. We're going to talk about the advertiser's perspective in a minute, but let's continue. I'd love to hear from Green Gameloft about your ad monetization strategy. How important is it to Green? Um, I think there are like um, different aspects you need to consider when you are integrating an ad into your game. Um, I will say if you have um, how casual the game on one axis, like super casual game, mid-core game, hardcore game, and in the other case, you have like the um, alternative monetization solutions. What you will see is um, the people who are um, pretty much engaged, and that is usually the case for hardcore gamers, they will probably do not want to um, diminish their experience in the game. You probably wanna, don't want to take them away from, the, from the, uh, their experience. Um, I, I imagine like um, if you want to do uh, mid-core, hardcore uh, video ads or offer roles or anything like that, uh, we usually for Gree we do like opt-in solutions. Like users will say, okay, I want to go there. I want to actually want to watch this ad. In f in turn, in return, maybe I'm gonna get incentivized. I'm gonna get like a free jam, some hard currency for my time. Um, that's that's one way to do it. Like without, you know, as I mentioned, like user experience is super important for us. Uh, because of that, our general strategy is to do opt-in so uh, opt-in solutions. Um, but I agree with Dave. Actually, this is actually a super exciting era uh, in terms of like how deeply you can integrate ads or experience into your game. Um, just to give you an example, um, we have been working on a, a project where we want to do some branded LTQ with, uh, with a studio, like movie studio that I cannot say. But the idea was to come up with this you know, branded limited time quest where people are getting excited about the movie, collecting like, items about that movie, and if they complete the quest at the end, we opt them to watch the trailer and maybe give you a discount on tickets. So there are like solutions like that where you can kind of like leverage the, the brand, and the theme of the game, and, but also there are like cases where you just wanna do probably straight kind of like video ads, offerable ads. Thank you. Gameloft. Yeah, so just to put some context, so at Gameloft we are uh, a mobile only company. So uh, we do games only on um, smartphone and tablets. And, um, and advertising uh, is a very important topic for us today. So uh, at least that's something that we're looking at very closely. Um, today, most of our revenue is coming from, it's a vast majority of, the, of our revenue is coming from in-app purchase. Um, so that's one point. So for us, advertising is something that we are starting uh, to work with. But we want really to be focused on um, the quality of, of our games. Um, and what has changed is that it really the, the number of people that we can reach uh, with our games. Uh, it's massive audience. That was not the case like a few years ago. Now we have uh, 150 million monthly active users. So we really have a massive reach and a lot of them are not paying. So really the question is, yes, what, what do we do with, uh, with these users? Um, and it really, really depends on the game. So we've just launched today Modern Combat 5. Um, so our, uh, um, our last edition of our Modern Combat franchise, there's no ads, and I can tell you that we'll never have, we'll never sp you'll never see ads in Modern Combat, because we think that it's not a good sp space for ads. We think that uh, it doesn't add to the experience. It's a very immersive experience. People are very engaged in the game. Um, so it's an ad-free uh, game. Um, but we also launched today a game um, that's called uh, Dizzy Fruits, so you can uh, check it out, and it's uh, it's purely ad-based. So we also launched uh, was it was last week uh, Ninja Up. It's a purely ad-based uh, game. But when we say ad-based, it's um, it, it's ad-based because they're advertising in inside or for our own games or for third parties. Um, and um, the volumes are such, the audience is such, that uh, it makes sense to have, uh, to, to, to have this approach. 
Um, and that, when you say ad based, there's no IAP. It's just all. There's no IP. It's a free game, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, no IAP at all. How's it going so far? Uh, it's doing well. I mean, it's uh, it looks Early. like a lot of people have, are having fun with the games. Okay. Uh, so that's case of Ninja Up, a, a great adoption, uh, millions of people. Uh, Dizzy Fruit, it's a bit early because it was launched today only, uh, but uh, yeah. All right, so that's actually a good segue. Maybe, Volkan, you can talk a little bit about this, but how do you decide which ad products to um, integrate into your games? So, Baudouin just uh, talked about, and maybe you can answer as well, but you know. Maybe, yeah, okay, just quickly. Um, so that was a very big debate, debate internally because there are many ad, uh, many ad networks, many SDKs. Integrating an SDK, it's always complex, and then when you have many SDKs, you multiply the risk to have problems, and so we took a completely different, a completely different approach at Gameloft, so we are pre I think maybe one of the only publishers to do that, is we developed our own ad servers, so we, are, we have our own platform and our own ad units, um, and that's the way we, we're going now. How do you figure it all out, business intelligence guy? Yeah, so my background is in big data. Um, my, when I was trying to get my PhD, like I was trying to marry machine learning with quantum chemistry, by the way, which has nothing to do with games. But that kind of like background actually helps me to uh, cut through the, the most of the talks and focus on numbers. So what I want to do here is like talk about both on the quantitative side and the qualitative side. What are the things that we probably you know want to take a look at? Um, I think on the quantitative side, obviously, whenever you know the advertisers approach like the publishers like us, the first numbers they throw at is like eCPM, CPCV, you know, CTR rates, CVR rates, fill rates. Obviously, these are like factors that are quite important, right? And if you are integrating like a brand new um, you know, add solution into like an into a new game. Um, you can kind of like figure out, given the DAU and the volume, what kind of like uh, additional incremental revenue you can make. Um, so that's I think like most like the quantitative side. Um, the uh, the CEO of Rocky was mentioning like uh, targeting in terms of like age, gender, uh, basically demographics. I think that's that's a nice addition to have. The more that I know about my player, uh, the better it is, whether it's you're on the publishing side or the advertiser side. And we're probably going to talk about more about like what kind of advertising data we need. Uh, but again, like the capability of the company, like what kind of data they can provide us in return through their APIs, whether it's like aggregated level, like player level, how can I use that data to en enhance the experience? So those are on the quantitative side. On the uh, qualitative side, um, uh, um, as um, as we, as we have already kind of like mentioned, like the integrating SDK is usually like a problem. Like ease of integration is important. Like if someone tells you that it's going to take like a few hours, you can imagine it's going to take a day. If they say it's going to take like a few days, it's probably going to take a week to do the integration. And every time there's a new SDK coming up, Google changing their policy, Apple changing their policy, uh, you have to keep up with all these SDKs, right? So. If you imagine that you are like a big studio like us, where you have 20, 30 titles, and you have to deal with all those SDKs separately every time there's a change, it's a hassle. Um, so that's one thing, like how, are, how good they are with their SDKs, how good they are with customer support, especially on the technical side. If I run into a problem today, can I get a ping you know, to Damon right away and, you know, hey, we, we are in problem with like supersonic you know, SDK, can you guys help us out? Never. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's important uh, on the qualitative side. Um, th there are obviously other factors like the customization. Can I kind of like uh, change the way the players uh, interacting with the, with the interface? Does it have some gray logo or does it kind of like this, uh, does it feel like the piece of a game or does it completely look kind of like arbitrary to the game, right? The, that's I think also important, like customization is important. Um, and um, th there are kind of like other factors, I guess, um, that I'm going to talk about later. But I think these are like the most important ones that, that, we, that we consider. Great. Dave, you guys are seemingly video heavy or focused, but why video or why any other product? How do you guys deal with that question? Well, I, I think as these guys have pointed out, there's different types of games. A free game 
like a high repeat gameplay experience, like a Scrabble or Words with Friends, it's a f totally free game. It's going to, by definition, have a different advertising experience than a, than a, a freemium game that may be very deep with gameplay and, and not have a lot of uh, refreshes or levels to go through. And so you have to, you know, what we tend to do is leave it up to every individual game team to decide where and when to have an ad displayed in a game. But you also have to take into account that the gaming market is completely global, yet the ad market varies dramatically around the globe. So in North America, it's much more of a modern media market. The UK and Australia and New Zealand and largely English-speaking markets, some of the Western Euro mar Europe markets are increasingly, increasingly sophisticated and in using video as an asset. But in general around the world, the media assets aren't the same in every market. And so you have to have a system that's adaptable and, and contemplates that in North America, we might fill the, a lot of the interstitial or uh, engagement units with video, but in other markets, it may be a static ad or a flat ad or a banner ad or, or what have you. There's also the notion, you mean, the, I know the topic of this panel was standardization. I, I spent uh, 12 out of the last 15 years on the board of directors of the IAB, the Internet Advertising Bureau, and that was the, gov the sort of the industry trade body that helped usher in uh, a marketplace that's now bigger than television, internet advertising. And the only way it got to that point was by creating some basic standards that advertisers could understand and build plans against on an efficient basis. And so uh, it's not to say that you take the creativity out of the medium, you, especially in gaming, the last thing you want to do is, is box developers in. But the, the actual, you know, the delivery mechanism for the asset, whether that's a, a size or, or a spec, um, regardless of the container or the way it's presented to the user, advertisers need to have standardization in order the, for the business to scale. The way that Facebook, for example, is scaling right now. They've got a standard ad size that they can sell to brands, whether it's a, a, a video or a, a, a billboard or anything of that matter, we'll have to get there. And frankly, those units are already decided. The video sizes are already decided. So it's more about, you know, I think the creativity comes in around what the mechanism is and how a game implements it. And that can vary dramatically. But the assets need to be standardized at some level if you want to crack the code and pull dollars out of television and out of print. And that's exactly what's happening right now. The challenge is for gaming is it's a much more complicated medium than putting a video inside of a YouTube environment, right? A video in a video environment is very easy to do a video in a gaming environment where you've got the nuances of the business model and how the consumer is feeling about a, a mid-core hardcore game versus a casual game. And you really need to leave, you need to have flexibility in the system, but leave it up to the game developers to decide what's best and then allow them to look at the analytics and the numbers as they come in. And what I've seen in every single case is once the numbers start to roll in and they're good, the game developers start to get really proactive about, okay, what's a better way to do this to, to expose the user in a more meaningful manner and maybe drive the, the overall, overall revenue up. But I think the most important thing is it's in no one's interest to, to uh, lather games with advertising or interrupt the users in a way that's uh, disruptive. And it doesn't work for the advertisers, ultimately, if they're not direct response advertisers. The gaming space has been mostly direct response advertising, other games, <laughs> advertising in games, which is counterintuitive. But if, well, there's a lot of young people compared to me in the audience here. But, but when ESPN or cable TV started, anybody remember what the first decade of ESPN? Okay, we got a couple of hands. Don't, don't be embarrassed. You can raise your hand. <laughs> it was Chia Pet ads. It was, it was, it was like the Chia Pet and the, and the Pet Rock. And it was like, it was direct response. Psychic readings. Right, exactly. And, and, and now you turn on ESPN in prime time and you're getting the top brand advertisers. And I would argue that in the mobile game space, all this direct response advertising that's, that's filling the coffers right now, which is not ideal when you're sending your users not only out of your game but to a competitor's game is probably not the best thing for your business long term. If we get the model right and make it easy for brands to, to activate here, the results are going to be better than any other medium. Gamers are more engaged. And you'll start to see what happened on cable TV, which is the brands start to flow in. They see results. They, they, they create more budgets and they get bigger. But it does take industry initiatives. It takes some coalescing around uh, some basic standards so that, um, you know, at the end of the day, 
EA isn't competing with Gameloft and uh, uh, DNA for mobile ad three. dollars. We're competing, <laughs> three, sorry. We're, we're competing, and those guys too. We're competing with, with, with you know, Pandora and, and Hulu and Facebook and TV for that matter. And that's, so, so we, it, it behooves us all to, to get together and figure out you know, how to do it in a way that scales. All right, so I want to go a level deeper on that because now I want to start talking about the advertiser and the, what advertisers need and I think you've touched on some of it with regards to scale and standardization, but why are brand advertising, uh, brand advertisers buying the gaming channel right now? How is it different? What needs to happen for more uh, adoption of the gaming channel um, or even mobile video in general as far as, you know, what are the, what's the feedback you're getting right now in the marketplace? Start with Dave again. And I know, I don't think yeah. you necessarily talk to the brand advertisers too much, Volcon. A little bit. Okay. Little bit. We'll go down. But Dave, why don't you start with that? Like, what, are, what do the advertisers want? What do they need? What are they getting and not getting in the gaming space right now? Yeah, I mean, it, they base their decisions on data. They look at the results, the KPIs that matter for advertisers. It, it may be top of the funnel, awareness, uh, you know, just favorability, or maybe down lower in the funnel, purchase intent. Uh, like likelihood to recommend it to a friend. But those kind of metrics are consistently measured across print, radio, TV, and the internet, and now mobile. And I, I can tell you that although games in general don't, for a lot of reasons, we don't pull data out of the games the way that Facebook can pull out of their system or Twitter pulls out of their system. But despite all that, the results in gaming when done right are so much better than any other median. And, I, and we, we do a lot of third party studies. This isn't just like our data. This is using independent sources to measure campaigns on behalf of advertisers. And, and what you find is the, the scores are up in the, in the upper right quadrant. They're, they're typically in the top one or two percent of results that advertisers What are the see. metrics though? Like what is it? Completed views? Is uh, it completed, views is, completed views is one, but completed views is, is not really getting to what the advertiser cares about, unless it's like a movie who just wants to get a trailer out there. What brands really care about is uh, things like awareness. So if after seeing my campaign in mobile games and then they see me somewhere else, are they aware of me already compared to the group that didn't see me in the mobile game? And if the score is significantly higher than other mediums, then gaming's performing better. Favorability, so someone who came across uh, an ad inside of a game, choose to engage with an ad, engage with that ad, may have done a post ad uh, behavior. So typically at the end of these ads, like we have set up with, with, you, with Supersonic, you can go to their Facebook page and like them. You don't have to, you can go to their website. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. The metrics, you can, it, we, even with the automotive campaign that just won an award with Ford that was done across console and mobile, some, some significant double digit percent of the people decided to go down to the dealership and check the car out. There was no need to do that. There was nothing in the ad that you had to do no that to get anything. to go down there. Right, and it was significantly higher than they saw from other, other media types. And so those are the metrics they care about. They wanna build relationships with consumers that last. So if they go to their website, they go to their Facebook page, they go to their dealership, if they're likely to tell their friends about it. If you're rewarding a gamer in a game, courtesy of a brand, they'll actually tell all their friends, hey, come play, come play uh, you know, this real racing and get you know, free, free gold cur courtesy of uh, Ford Mustang. You know, they'll actually go out and, and tweet it or tell people on Facebook. So that's, there's the paid media that the brand might spend with you as a publisher, and then there's the earned media, which is what all the additional stuff they get. Gaming creates tremendous earned media yep. value. So, so the, the things they care about are, are, are the, all the way from the top of the funnel, awareness and favorability, all the way down to purchase intent. Is this person more likely to buy my you know, laundry detergent or my hot new car because of what I did in this platform versus all the other ones I can choose from? And as we know, all these media buyers are inundated by 900,000 different platforms to buy from. So if you don't break through the clutter and you don't have great results, you're really dead in the water anyway. Cool. Thank you. Uh, you guys want to talk about it too? What do advertisers want in it your was experience? was a beautiful summary. Yeah. I think, I, you know, in, in two words, definitely like data and tracking. Like, you got to be able to target your audience. If I'm Coca Cola, I want to know if that guy that's watching my ad has something to do with Coca Cola or is like a friend of Coca Cola, right? Um, 
so that's very important. How are you going to measure like the data? How are you going to measure their engagement levels? I mean, the probably cost, you know, uh, CPCV is okay, you know, video compilation, but you really want to measure like the engagement, and it's actually a hard problem. I don't think necessarily the advertising industry has the right tracking in place yet, uh, and they are working on that. Uh, but, well, but once we have that, I think it's going to be pretty awesome for advertisers. Yep. Um, uh, the other aspect is, uh, I guess, the also, you can also imagine uh, for like an ad product, I will imagine if I'm watching like video ad, am I going to be able to go and visit the web, web page of Ford, for instance, right? Ford Explorer. Or can I sign up with their Facebook pages or uh, Twitter pages, et cetera, r right away? So that kind of like a follow-up interaction might be actually valuable, I imagine, for brands. Um, po post ad engagement. Yeah. Whatever they might, whatever that might be, always through the roof. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I imagine yes for brand awareness, the movie trailers or you know uh, some cool regular TV ads is actually pretty pretty okay. But if you want to get real engagement, you have to come up with some brand new ways to make an interactive, uh, interactive kind of like experience for player as they are in watching that. So you have the player here, you have the ad here. How do I make sure? that guy is actually paying attention. How do I make sure that that guy is actually in, you know, in getting entertained by, by that ad product? And there are like a few companies out there who are exploring this opportunity. Uh, one of them is uh, Unlockable, I heard. So what they do is like they watch you to watch the video ad, and uh, at the end, they come up with some trivia or puzzle or quest. That's about the ad. So it's basically they are building like mini games within the game. That will help to kind of like drive probably crazy engagement metrics for for the advertisers. So there are solutions like that. Yep. Um, I, I think the field is still developing, but as I said, I think the big big thing is here is like how I'm gonna you know get my players engaged with that ad. That's the first part, and the second and the, the more important part I, I think is the the data and tracking as they mentioned. That's 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 huge. Cool. But why? Yeah, what we see from from advertisers is of course demographics. They want to know who the audience is. Uh, and what's good in gaming is we have kind of interest graph based on what people play. So it's a lot of value just to qualify uh, the audience. So uh, the demos of the audience, that's one. Um, tracking is key and third party tracking is key, which is they're asking us to have a third party to track what's going on uh, with the advertising. And it's very fragmented today. There are many options, many solutions. And I mean, what we have to do is Basically, we are adapting to what the media agencies want. So they all have their preferred um, solution. So hopefully, at one point, it will be more standardized. But that's what we're facing today. Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, I think that uh, what brands need is uh, to see more <laughs> of them, of uh, campaigns made by some of their peers. Uh, we see that a huge inertia in moving to this new. Um, to this new uh, advertising opportunity. The first to move are, of course, game developers, because we, we get it. <laughs> we are selling games, mobile games, so we get how it works. And uh, um, so, yeah, the more, the more examples. So I think that the Twitter and the Facebook, they're doing an amazing job, <laughs> because they are showing and opening the, uh, the way. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, um, the, that's kind of big inertia in the, in the okay. industry. All right, so let's get a little technical. Um, you talked about, we're talking about standardization. So what tools are you guys using currently uh, to manage your ad business? Uh, whether it be from a serving side or mediation platforms, what, there are, there are obviously developers of all shapes and sizes in the room right now. So how do they get started? If they have scale, what tools do they need to be successful? Don't all raise your hand at once. Uh, so yeah, so, yeah, so I, I just said a few, few words uh, about that uh, previously. So we decided to go uh, with our own ad server for some reason I explained. Um, so of course to do that, uh, you need a, a scale, uh, you need a size to do that. So you know, other, other big companies or big apps like Pandora, they have their, they do, a, they do the stuff internally. Uh, so it means that you need also your own uh, ad sales team. So that's what we are building. Uh, it's also a lot of uh, resources. Um, and then, then in terms of tools, we adapt to what the customers want, or what the, the advertisers want. So in terms of tracking, uh, in terms of surveys, so Comscore, uh, we have a lot of our, a lot of our um, 
uh, partners want to have Comscore in the mix. Um, so we pretty much adapt to what they want. Really quickly, let's not assume everyone knows what Comscore is. I mean, I think most, <laughs> there aren't that many that make the Comscore list, but it's basically the tracking of audience or the amount of audience you get on a monthly basis, yes? And, I, and, and because all of these brands were well, very used to work with the Comscore on, on the internet, so they pretty much want to just replicate uh, what they've been doing uh, on the internet in the mobile space. What if you don't have a direct ad sales team, Volkan? So uh, what we do is, uh, obviously for different games, we have different names, needs, and looking at the uh, supply and the demand curve, uh, for instance, we have decided to use uh, mediation in some of our products. And out there, we have Sponsor Pay, now called Fiber, we have Supersonics Ultra. There are like a few solutions out there, unless you want to build it in-house. Um, so you know, you definitely check those products out, I will say. Um, the supply curve is important, obviously. The, in terms of like reporting, I think almost all the companies out there provide some sort of API. Um, at GRI, we have our own data warehouse solutions. We try to kind of like standardize the data, pull everything together from all different advertisers. I think we probably work about like more than 10 advertisers on the publishing side. So to be able to keep the data uh, in shape, uh, we need some kind of like standardization of that data flowing into our system. And again, um, if we had the opportunity to uh, do targeting uh, through the either their dashboards or on, on dashboards, um, some kind of like a tool to help us to target our users. Um, just to give you an example, if I do not want to show ads for any player below level 15, is there any way that I can make that customization without hard coding into my code base? Right? Can I do it on the let's say with, with the super sign? Can I do it with like you know with uh, sponsor pay or ad colony? Or, um, or Archie, you know, we, we have been working with like multiple products. So there's still some room to grow, I will say, from the advertiser side. They haven't built all the tools that we need, so we are building custom solutions on ourselves. But if you have provide such targeting, and if you close the loop between like the engagement of that player and the ad type, collecting all that data and actually making the next ad more relevant to the user, then it's a good experience, I will say. That's probably what the kind of tools that we want to build together. Cool. Dave, you have any comments on this topic? I would just, uh, the one comment I would make is that there's a tremendously strong ecosystem out there of uh, companies that are aggregating the demand and can bring it uh, to inventory that exists in a game, and that can be done through direct relationships with those companies or programmatically uh, through real-time bidding and and ad exchanges and, and and I think just like on the internet what's going to happen in mobile is you're going to end up with what used to be sort of three buckets of how to monetize your content one was um, real-time bidding automated the middle bucket was ad networks you go establish relationships with and then uh, IP owners people that had strong brands would build their own sales organizations. And what happens over time is the automated, programmatic exchange side of it grows and grows and grows because it's efficient and it's based on data. And the IP-based property, so you know, ESPN got a lot of press on the internet about pulling their inventory out of the market and just handling it themselves from, away from networks. And the networks, it gets, it gets more, more difficult to identify where the audience is going to come from, and you end up with consolidation and that kind of stuff. I think mobile is going to move. Mobile is moving very quickly to to mediating multiple ad exchanges and and demand against the inventory. And some of the bigger players in the space are are moving in to to facilitate that for mobile publishers. And I wouldn't recommend building an ad sales team at all, unless you have. And and the real, I'll give a little bit of color on that, why I'm saying that, unless you have very large audience, number one, like uh, I think, you know, tens of millions of, of DAUs or uh, MAUs, as well as really great IP, because when you, tr first of all, if you ever, anybody in the room try and call anybody on an on a ad agency basis that works in, you know, Madison Avenue or somewhere, do they ever answer the phone? Can you can you get them on the phone? The answer is, there, you can, Dave. It's impossible. There, I mean, 
There, no one can answer. Everybody's so harried right now. They can't get on the phone. They have a million people calling on them. It's so hard to break through the clutter unless you're, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, you know, Fox, ESPN. You know, and there's a, there's there's maybe a couple hundred properties out there that can get their phone call returned. But it's very, you know, the the. But the amount of people that are building sales organizations to go do that are in the thousands. It's so hard to break through the clutter. And I don't know that the return on investment is there because New York's an expensive place to open an office. People there demand a lot of money. Uh, they have to have big expense accounts and take people out. You, you know, you got to do the dinners. You probably got to get a yacht in, uh, in, in Cannes, right? We have some, so I know I see some people in the room who have companies who have nice yachts in Cannes. You know, like to get a yacht in Cannes is a couple million dollars. If you don't have a yacht in Cannes, you're really not in the business, right? And so, so I mean, that's that's kind of where you're, you know, you're kind of getting into that. That's where the money's going. It's going to a select group of companies that have IP and that have, uh, you know, that can make the investment to support those businesses. And it goes to big franchises and big events like the Academy Awards and the Super Bowl and stuff like that. I'm not sure it makes sense to make that investment. As a, as a mobile or casual developer, if you can get enough trajectory from the marketplace that exists through the exchanges and through real-time bidding and, and by exposing the data about your users um, in, a, in obviously in a, in a privacy compliant way, but th that allows um, the targeting of the advertising to drive the yield, yield of that up. There's a, a very strong ecosystem out there. And then there's you know second parties that can represent your inventory directly. Damon, I think you could talk to that as well. But I just don't, I mean, hiring, a, building a sales team is a super expensive proposition. I think left for the companies that have the right IP and the right audience, frankly. How much time do I have left, Gordon? Five minutes? I have, uh, do we have, uh, I want to leave it open for questions. I'll start with one last. Do you have anything yeah, to add? Just, a, just a, last com uh, a last comment um, that we've seen with advertisers is uh, anything, that, uh, anything that goes through a network is very efficient, it's uh, low cost, it's cool, but we've seen that advertisers are also interested to know exactly where they advertise, to know exactly in which app, exactly in which game, exactly at what moment. And and it's key information for them. So any system, any solution that you will choose, I mean, must, you must take that into account, which is, can, I, can the advertiser know exactly where we advertise? So that's... Um, All right, so we have a couple minutes left. I have a, maybe a couple of questions. The first one is, let's talk a little bit about the future. And I think, Dave, you kind of painted a picture there. Um, but are there, few, are there products that any of your companies are working on that maybe have not yet come out or is there any are there trends uh, affecting which which ad products you guys launch what are the advertisers asking for that have not yet come out those types of things what does the future hold I want to keep it kind of broad but or is it or are we there yet <laughs> I would just say that gaming is clearly on the cutting edge of where the rest of advertising is going to go. Uh, anybody watch the Tour de France? Any Tour de France fans here? On, okay. It's brutal to watch the Tour de France live on TV. It's four hours. There's got to be two and a half hours of commercials during that four hours. It's the same four ads running over and over again. And there's one for like a discount bike. I, the thing is I, I DVR the tour, right? So I haven't actually watched a single ad yet. But I, I go through them at 4x speed so I can see what they are. So I've seen the same four ads over and over again. And that's a terrible user experience. And that's what the TV model is built on, a terrible user experience. So everybody's trying to avoid it. Gaming is kind of ushering in this notion of user consent and control, which you see on Hulu with the ad selector. You see on YouTube. TrueView is a great, great model. If you don't like the ad, after five seconds, you can skip it. That's, consumers feel great about that. Well, we're taking it one step further in gaming and saying, don't even see an ad unless you choose to see an ad. And then when you do, I think the onus is on us to make those ads enjoyable, rewarding, and fun. But that's, that's a radical, radical change in a, in, a, in a world that for 100 years has been all about shoving something in someone's face so they can't avoid it. You're reading a magazine, the ad is there. You listen to the radio, it shows up. They all, all the news stations run the ad at the exact same time on radio so you can't avoid the ad. Yeah. Right? But gaming, we're saying, no, no, we're saying, hey, consumer, you're in control. You choose if you want to engage in that. If you don't, move on with your life. But if you do, you're going to be 
feel great about. The value exchange is there, you're gonna feel really good about it. And every survey we see, it's in the high 90s, 97, 98, 99% of the users say, that was awesome, I want more of it. What other ad medium gets that kind of response? It's just crazy, and so this is the future. The people just don't know that yet. We're, we're, we're on the cutting edge. <laughs> I like that answer. Volkan, what do you have to say about the future? Okay, as a gamer, um, I agree with what they said. Um, as a gamer, I think the big question we want to ask is like, why do I play games to start with? If you want to build like an awesome product, that's the first question you want to answer. Why do we play games, right? I think there are like, I mean, according to academia, there are like three big topics there. Like mastery, you want to master something, right? That's one. Volition, you want to be able to make a choice, which is exactly what they said, right? You want to be able to opt out. If you don't want to watch an ad, just skip. Um, and that's, that's also very important. And the third one is immersion, which is kind of counterintuitive. Immersion? If, if, immersion, like immersion. if you want to immerse yourself into game, at what point do you want to show an ad and take that experience, give that like, you know, crappy experience to your users? So how do you balance that? So these are the reasons why we play games, if you happen to believe academia is right, okay? And making that adjustment and balance ads in the games, I think that's where, where we need to kind of like go back to the, you know, square and square one and figure out like what we need to do to keep those all in balance. There are really cool products out there that I like in the future. Um, Everplay is interesting. Content generation by users, that's huge. That's probably what you want to do. Um, Twitch is doing awesome. Like Everplay is probably going to do awesome you know, in the future. Um, Ad-based games might be interesting. Um, how do I make sure that the players are going to you know, get engaged with the ads that you're going to show? I think that's interesting. Um, and I think the other big factor, as we have discussed uh, before, data and tracking. You want to provide as an advertiser and, and tracking to your advertiser and the publisher. If I know you watch a, like a Pepsi ad now, what is the likelihood that you're going to show up in the store in Walmart and grab like a, I don't know, six packs, right? That's what I want to know as an advertiser. And are, as a publisher, it, I probably want to know that information as well. Are you using well. in-house tools or are you licensing tools for Most tracking? Most of the report? tools we use are in-house, unfortunately, um, because I think the, as they mentioned, the mobile advertising industry is still you know, taking its baby steps right now. And I think it's gonna be, uh, in a few years, it's gonna probably gonna catch up with what we have seen you know, over, over, the, over the internet. Like, I think it's gonna happen. It's just a matter of like, how fast you're gonna get there. Um, Location-based advertisement, I think that's gonna be huge. Um, it's, it's, we are getting there, but there are still like a lot of you know, unexplored opportunities out there for sure. But one. Um. I would say video, that's really the, the format that we'll see more and more. Uh, so probably some iteration about the length, skippable, non-skippable. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Um, I think we're somewhat out of time here. Yes, Gordon yeah. Bellamy has a question. Okay, so, oh, use the mic. Yeah, use the mic, man. Um, sort of going back in my, my TiVo'd mind, when you were talking about the IAB committee, Right, and then sort of over the course of conversation, I hear you guys talk a lot about we, but it's, it sounds in my head like you're talking about me, like we, my company, this is what we're doing. And I guess I'm curious, what is the, the friction, if you've all identified sort of the same problem, to the community coming together and going like, it's not perfect, but here are our standards. Look how much volume we have at community, you know, to moving that dialogue forward. Because it sounds like you're all putting a lot of energy into your own solutions, but not into the problem that you've all identified. Does that make sense well, as a question? The, I mean, there are, some, there are some industry trade groups getting started to tackle some of the standardization. Is that, is that what you're I, asking? I guess, like, oh, well, maybe, I may ask, like, who do you think should be entrusted, right? There's a, there's a basic question. Mobile game ads, what are the first baby standard units that we agree on right. that we're all going to use, even though we're going to continue to innovate? Yeah, I, don't, I wasn't actually suggesting that the mobile game industry should create the ad standards for mobile. I think, I think the mobile ad standards are, are already ahead of the implementation wow. in games. We're just taking the standards that are out there and wrapping them in a way that works well for gaming. I, I, in other words, a video ad is a video ad is a video ad. It just may, sh you know, the way it's displayed 
or the mechanism by which it's displayed might vary in a game versus on a uh, on a on a you know a media property or something. But, but sort of I guess part B, like sort of what you were talking about, like why people play games, right? Might be very different than why people watch video, right? And so there might be something which is a mobile game ad, the same way like a radio ad became a TV ad, right? It probably was easier for them to do just just do audio, but TV is different. Like games are different than mobile video, right? Like watching ESPN on my phone is different than playing your game on my phone innately. So it would seem like there'd be a discussion about what is a mobile game ad? Like what does our medium bring to advertising? Well, I, I, again, I, I think I understand where you're going, but I guess what I'm saying is there's, there has to be a common currency mm -hmm. that exists across not just games, but the mobile industry. I think I think correctly you've stated that video is really that currency. I mean, I think video in advertising is a currency because of the creative aspect, the ability to tell a story, to engage someone. You know, the, what Nike did with their four-minute spot around the World Cup was amazing. Every week you see these ad age and ad weeks posts of the, the cool stuff out there. So I think the medium, the, crea the creative medium exists. It's really about how you wedge it into a game in a way that works for the game developer and the player in a positive way. And I think that's where, I don't know that, uh, whether there's actually standards around that or more there's tools and tech that work well across multiple, multiple game companies. No, I don't, I'm, I'm not suggesting anything's emerged yet that is like a de facto standard for that, but the notion of games doing it in a way that's a better player experience by putting the player in control is very powerful. But is there a notion of a standard, like ever, of like a, just of agreement? Like we ought to just agree for agreement's sake. I think what I think the answer to your question, Dave, I'll just say it more plainly. So, we're taking the video, and in this case, making it a rewarded video. So, to me, the rewarded video games were definitely the first medium or channel to do a rewarded video. So, I think that might be the answer to your question. Taking a video from the internet and making it a rewarded video is the way in which we gamified that ad unit. And what's cool in a game, you can redeem immediately. <laughs> That's pretty unique. Other questions? Um, yeah, Brian Roth with Fuse Powered. Um, I'm curious what the, for an innovative ad unit or a, a more native integration, if you will, what sort of a minimum dollar figure you need to hear from an agency or a brand. And then I'm also curious who internally at your companies, I guess Dave, specific to you, um, to your comment of not hiring a sales team, kind of where, who within your organization is the conversation taking place about innovative ad units um, within your, your mobile games? Uh, maybe not hiring a sales team. But I think if you have games that are interesting to brands, you still might have to have someone who's sort of a biz dev role that's interacting between your developer developer team and the advertiser and the ad agency because you really don't want to have advertisers talking directly to a team that's focused on building the best game they can. That You definitely need that buffer and that, that uh, capability. That's, I, I think um, uh, the native ad type is uh, maybe different than a custom ad. When you, when you start programming into the code base a brand, um, that's that's a much more complicated relationship, and it, the game has to be right. The brand it's almost like a needle in a haystack type scenario. It works really well in sports where you've got official league partners who are already doing stuff on TV, and they want to mirror it in the gameplay experience. When you when you get to um, some more casual games, you can do some really cool stuff with uh, you know fun, energetic, casual games where it makes sense to integrate a brand. And in. those are really business development deals. The the standardization of media through an SDK into a game that works across dozens or hundreds or thousands of games in the same similar fashion is what I'm suggesting then can be run much more automated and programmatically and you don't necessarily need to build out a huge sales team to do it unless you have IP that's so amazing that brands just have to talk to you directly because they need to be in that IP. And that's where you, you, know, if you do the regression analysis. Is it worth the expense of building that team out? Am I going to bring enough revenue in uh, and does it make sense for everybody? But in general, um, I think the foundation for the industry needs to be built on just some standardized media tech and media that allows for revenue to flow, just flow right in. All right, that's it. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.